Oh, uh, I'm. I could go down so many different paths with that. No, no. Let's just, let's just. Uh, this, what's the startup podcast? Was it? No, I don't know what it is anymore. It's, hi, everyone. I'm here with Ed, founder of Gigden, and today we're going to talk about startup journeys, pivoting, validation, learning, and so much more. So stay tuned. How are you? I'm amazing. It's early in the morning. It is. I'm not gonna lie. It's uh, hard today to get out of bed and get into this awesome office. This is a really cool office, by the way. Thank I you. would love to like take the camera right now, but maybe we're gonna do that later. We'll do it after. Um, you can do like show like all the good stuff in here. Yeah. And um, okay, so Ed, um, I've known you for a little bit, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I I've known you when you started kicked in. You designed our first. I did. Website. That's if so you true. Remember, I did. Working with I, the blue chili guys. Yeah, yeah, I designed the first website, the first logo, and um, it's all gone now. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the logo was a great logo, but we actually got a trademark infringement notice from LinkedIn. Oh no way! I did not know that. So we actually chopped and changed it. There so, you go. Can yeah. you quickly talk about that story? Like, what happened? Or is that a bad? <laughs> like, should we not? talk about we this. got the email that they said oh my god change your fucking logo because <laughs> it looks too much like ours yeah so we changed it and then we um sent an email over to the the ceo of linkedin or yeah. the managing director of linkedin um and it was it's all good at the end but we needed a bit of a rebrand anyway what so a like, what a party pooper you oh are no. unbelievable because it was geeked in, linked in, yeah. <laughs> too similar. We always thought at the beginning that um, if we do fall into trouble, hey, it's a good thing because it means we're growing to become big enough for them to actually care. So, and that's actually really cool then. Yeah. So it's like, yes, I yes. finally got a reaction yes, out they of care. them. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good cares. sign, we're on the right track. <laughs> Let's start in the beginning. Um, how did you come up with with the idea of starting the business in the first place you i know you're very passionate about music mm. so that plays a role yeah and yeah. uh yeah just let's talk about that like when did you start like to give it a, a year when did you start kick then yeah okay so the kick is actually it's a four-year-old company um we um ooh. <laughs> Come back in there. <laughs> it's drifting off to the side there. Okay. Um, so Gigden is actually a four-year-old company. Um, the last year, we've been pushing a live entertainment subscription service, um, which has really started to take off. But the first three years, they included a lot of pivoting and a lot of learning about the industry and getting to product market fit. Um, but I originally started four years ago. Yeah. It was uh, it started because I was really frustrated. I never got to see my favorite artists live, pretty much. Um, I always could see that venues were really empty, artists were struggling, they wanted to play in front of new audiences. Um, and inherently, it's really risky when you put on a music event, right? As a promoter, you've got to put down money, you have to book the venue, and you've got to pray and hope that you sell enough tickets. And for me, because of that reason, a lot of the really cool acts from overseas wouldn't, weren't mm. being booked in Australia. So I thought, how could we de-risk this whole process? Um, and that's what I'm sorry, created. hold on. <clears throat> so you basically created it so you can get artists that you want to see into Australia? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Well, the idea is like because most events don't sell out and yeah. a lot of promoters can lose money, right? And a lot of artists and anyone that puts on a really big show or a tour. And so if we could de-risk that whole process by getting fans to pledge to buy tickets with mm. events only going ahead once we reach the minimum number, um, like a Kickstarter for events, then we'd be able to book any act from any country into Australia or any Australian artists overseas without any of the risk. Um, so that's when we first started the business, took some founding investment from Blue Chili at the very beginning um, and built it out and it worked really well 
for a lot of emerging and mid-tier artists, but we couldn't crack it for some of the really big acts mm. because as it turns out, it actually shows to the industry if you're an artist putting up a crowdfunding campaign that uh, you're not that confident being able to sell tickets. Mm. So that was a really big key learning, right? Yeah, wow. So basically the initial model kind of like fell over then because it was all about the crowdfunding part. Yeah. So you pivoted. How did you come up with the subscription subscription service then? So we pivoted, but it wasn't into the sub subscription yet. Yeah. So we pivoted by um, staying close to our customer, which was the promoter or the event organizer. Mm. And we ended up working with a couple of international tours, but instead of a pure crowdfunding campaign, we ended up um, running marketing campaigns on behalf of these tours and festivals. So one example is we put together this platform and we built some tech around a support stock competition because we learned that young artists, whether it's a young band or a young DJ, they build their careers by opening for bigger headliners, mm. right? Yeah. So they're really motivated for these opportunities. So we ran a campaign with a tour that was happening around Australia. Uh, we had 200 bands sign up, young bands. Um, and from them, they attracted over 30,000 registered votes through our platform. That's amazing. And it was a number one driver in ticket sales. Yeah. Uh, it was an amazing database building exercise for both us and the event organizer yeah. and it was a really really strong model which drove a lot of awareness for the show without any paid media and so that was really really great uh, but and so what we looked to do after that was we, we wanted to monetize it so we started looking at brands and then we started working with the management of cold chisel massive aussie band and then how we did shopped you it get out. to work with them like, what was the did you just ring them up and or did you already build at that stage so much credibility with the gig them platform yeah. that it was much easier for you to now, you know, make these contacts? Or a combination of, of, of that. I mean we started being to being known in the industry maybe as well. Yeah, so yeah. we started to getting known in the industry, we started running these campaigns and people started to realise, you know, what's this gig them thing it looks really cool. Yeah. And then it was one of our one of our investors actually did an introduction to the manager. Um, who's, in my opinion, the best manager in the country. He's managed a lot of other really, really great actors. Do you want to well. give him a shout out? <laughs> oh, his name's John Watson. Um, John Watson, you rock. Yeah, he's, he's, um, I've met a few people in the industry now. And yeah. He was one of the, one of the standout ones. Um, definitely. So, so how come, so, like, what makes him such an awesome dude? Well, I think it was, it's a combination of, of so many things. I mean, just, having such a long-term vision of, of an artist yeah. uh, and their career, um, the market as well, which they play in, um, the creativity, the vision, um, and then also just an incredible amount of industry knowledge um, and history of music and where, where, it, where it's come from, where it's going and, and, and how an artist fits into that and, and how they're able to have not only their music but their, their image and their story and everything else just be projected into the world yeah. and, and create that as well um yeah m more wisdom when it comes to the music industry that i'll ever accumulate in, in several lifetimes yeah but anyway we ended up working with with him and um from there we looked to monetize that with brands mm. so we shopped out this model to a whole bunch of brands and so what really type of brands would you go for then in that case? All the biggest what brands in the country. It? Okay. All the biggest telcos, car brands, liquor brands, yeah. everything. Um, so we just took it to market. I guess music goes with everything. So Yeah, I mean, they all want to. It's a passion cool. point. Yeah. Music's a massive passion yeah. point for, for a lot of brands and they want to engage with, with audiences through, through music. Yeah. Um, so, so we shopped it out to brands um, and we got really close to posting a million in revenue. We got so close to, to winning a campaign, ding, ding, but ding. we couldn't, we just couldn't snag it right at the end because of the short lead time. And then so from there, we looked to realize, um, okay, there's still the inherent problem in the industry, mm. it's inefficient. Um, event organizers, promoters, venues, they really still want more people at the shows, same with artists. Um, we have a really big database. We've got a database of about 50,000 by this point in time. And we've got this really amazing network of brands. Mm. Plus, there was early movements in the United States of a, sim a mob model similarly doing something um, around subscriptions and live music. Um, and they ended up raising a bit of money and, and growing to 20 cities. Um, so yeah, this model's validated and it works. And um, at that time we were kind of 
um, we had all the assets, the relationships, and the strategic advantage to yeah. lock it up in all of APAC. So, yeah. so we launched it as a complementary part of the business. Um, but it started to really take off. So how did you? So when you yeah. when when you decide, okay, we're going to do the subscription subscription service. Yep. So you base it on things like the, in the US there was a, there was someone doing it and they already proved that model. Did you just roll it out to everyone, or did you actually test it with a few people and get also like insights from? Because you have this you had this database of fifty thousand. Did you actually like use that also to get like their feedback on like, mm. hey, how would you would you like that sort of? Yeah. Yeah. Even though you should never ask someone if they would like something because they will always say yes. Yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah. Did you did you make use of the database or did you just like okay we're just gonna push it and we'll see if people sign up for it and that's and that's what we're gonna use as our validation to see if that works or not. Yeah, good question. So um, there was a little bit of validation from the states, but it, we didn't just rip it off and just yeah. clone it. So because also I guess with different countries, different parameters. Like, yeah, I mean we we in. had already we'd already. Um, come up with the idea ourselves because yeah. we were looking at a consumer facing product offering which we could use to leverage the data that we have and yeah. um, also the relationships and the ability for us to access really great inventory in the industry was a, a competitive advantage mm -hmm. of ours already so um, we did a whole bunch of things around you know just general lean methodologies so yeah, you'd call up members you'd call up customers you'd do some um, lean testing through some Facebook ads, I see mm. or whatever it might be, and just tested product offerings and, and things like that. And then ultimately, yeah, you end up just building a bit of tech, having a look to see if you could get customers off the back of that and if the response has been positive. And then as you start to generate more validation and it starts to make sense and you project it out through Excel and everything else like that, um, um, and you've got a thesis as behind a business model that would make a lot of sense that could scale. That was one thing. Another thing that we that was challenging for us before is there's a B two B focused business. It's hard to scale, right? <laughs> oh God, I'm like the entire office is falling apart. Yeah, and you heard the word scale, and you <laughs> so were just I'm like, like oh, oh my God, I'm getting nervous. Oh, now. scale! We've never talked about scale before in a startup oh conversation. Um, Here we go again. It's all about scaling. <laughs> about scale. um, so yeah, that, that, that there were a couple of things that. Um, gave us the confidence to yeah. start building it up. Yeah. I really like that. I like that. It's such a like. It's almost like a, a fairy tale sort of a startup story, isn't it? Did you think? I or, guess so. Or maybe you just presented it way, but it, it seems to me like. I mean, the way you started. Like, let's talk about that. What made? How did you get your investment? What do you think is important? Um, if you go and fundraise, what mm. do you, or what did your investors look for? And yeah, so because I know you're a hustler, so <laughs> yeah. Um, well, if you think about when we closed our first round of funding, yeah. it was officially closed. I think it was somewhere at some point in 2015. We're in 2017 now, um, and we weren't building a subscription platform at that point in time yet. It was still around that crowd funding, crowdsourcing marketing campaigns for events yeah. time. We will suddenly work with brands as well. And our investors have been really supportive from then until now. But if you think about it from an investor's point of view, they invest in a different business than what we have today. Oh, yeah, right? absolutely. Completely and this business. happens all the time, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, um, we did, like, when I was working on Vimily, which is now called Verbate. God, I think I dropped this name like twice in my in, in these podcasts. Mm. I got to stop. like. By the, um, yeah, there's like, we did like a 360 pivot, like completely different, yeah. different thing in the end. Yeah. It started as a family thing and then it was like a business tool. Um, at least you stick to music. Which is yeah. good. <laughs> well, we've, we've, we've broadened out to live entertainment now as yeah. well recently, which has been working really well. But yeah, but well, I love the whole idea of actually um, getting people, like your vision is like getting people up from their couch and going out and yeah. you know, just Vision's not like sticking the on, the, yeah. on the mobile phone and um, or watching, watching something like just being passive, just yeah. go out and be active. So that's really cool. Yeah. But yeah, so... Pivoted. So they invested in crowdfunding yeah. and now it's subscription. Music is still the overall topic or events. Do you do other stuff as well? It's experiences broadly now, but, but music's always going to be a big part of our DNA. So, yeah. um, yeah, just on that note before that you were saying, one of the key learnings for me was um, to remain really passionate about the problem that you're solving, mm. but not necessarily to the solution. 
that you're taking to market because it might, first solution might not be the right one. Um, so yeah, back on the investment side of things, we we closed, uh, we, we went out to market to put half a million together, a um, bit of a seed round, ended up oversubscribed for that. And <clears throat> I think the earlier the business generally, um, the more the people are important. So, what did you have in place to close that round and being oversubscribed? Well, we had early shoots of traction with yeah. um, the business that we were building. It was generating revenue, but it was really minuscule amounts of revenue mm. at the time. Um, and But we did have traction with regards to, you know, we were running campaigns for tours, starting to work with some big event organizers, promoters, great acts. Um, but ultimately, I think it's your job as a founder to just communicate a vision, mm. be super confident in it, um, and give investors confidence that you are you as the founder and the team that you have around you um, are the right people in order to figure out whatever it is you need to do in order to make it happen. Because ultimately, one of the most uh, one of the most strongest predictors of success, in my opinion, when it comes to uh, building a successful business or startup, is resilience. So any way that you can kind of show that through action um, would, I, I would, I would think, would be a, a big tick for a sophisticated investor that knows yeah. what it takes to build a startup. Yeah. yeah. I think also, like, especially like in early stage, um, because some, you know, we all start, we start out and we don't have like the, the credibility of like already having a, an exit here and there. And yeah, you didn't yeah, have yeah. an exit before, no. right? So you, that was your first baby. And, which is amazing. Like how many, not, I don't want to like put the mood down right now, but how many is it? Nine out of 10 usually don't make it. So there are so many startups. Mm. And um, so you're special. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I still don't feel like we've made it yet. I mean, it's so, um, so much but work. It's for us going, to do. like, it's going, of course, like, it's, yeah. you know, like, it probably will never stop. Like, yeah, I guess so. That's the, that's the startup. But, um, yeah. yeah, so early stage, probably investors really look into, um, the team itself yeah, and the sure. cap capability yeah. um, of what you can do and how you see your vision. So if you're not passionate about it, then they are not going to be passionate about it. Yeah, either. for sure. What do you think is the uh, most important thing to invest in if you want to build a startup as a founder? Okay. So from the founder side. Yeah, okay. Um, what a good question that is. <laughs> <laughs> you're all about the good I didn't, questions. I know, I didn't come Cat, up with that myself, no. sorry. But um, anyway. <laughs> Um, so I think that the most important thing to invest in if you want to build a successful startup is yourself. Um, Warren Buffett likes to ask this question you know, and it's, mm. if you could have any car in the world, right? And pick any car, name it and overnight it'll be parked in your driveway. It's yours. You've got it forever. But the only catch is that car is the only car that you could have for the rest of your life. Oh, well, I don't so, even have a car. What does that say about me? <laughs> <laughs> but you act lean, maybe. I'm you very, I'm super lean. You. It's all about lean. Sound like I'm taking the bus. Yeah. I don't even have a bike. <laughs> I'm walking. Wow, that's super lean. I like your approach. You must have read Testing Eric Reese's the market. Book. Yeah. Um, so if you only got one car, you'd probably take care of it really well, right? Mm. You'd probably clean it pretty often, make sure it's in good condition, um, make sure that it doesn't break down, and um, really invest in making sure that this car's in pretty good shape. Um, but the thing with cars is they depreciate over time. So imagine if this car was a car where you could add capability to it, you know, you could upgrade it. You can add things to it. You can make it go faster. You can make it more efficient. Um, so that question, when he asked that, made me really, really it changed my thinking over a lot of things. When, when was and that? When did you hear that? When? Yeah. How long ago? And what did it change? Well, it was a while ago. So I've, I've always looked up to Warren Buffett, not not because of his net wealth, but just his approach to money and and 
how he doesn't even value him. He still drives the same cars, oh, still lives in the same house in Omaha. So I look up to him in a lot of different ways. But in case people don't know who it is, do you want to give a quick summary to? Um, Warren Buffett is one of the greatest investors in the world. He's got an amazing knack for being able to really pick winners and has really championed um, Ben Graham's philosophy on value investing. Mm. Um, I, I wouldn't be able to do a good justice by condensing what he's all about, but, but check him out if you haven't heard of him yet. But um, yeah. anyway, he that question shaped my thinking. And um, from, a, from an early age, for me, I was always in, investing a lot in myself. Um, I used to be really shit at public speaking, like I was nervous as hell doing that. Well, so I, look at you, like, <laughs> it's not public speaking though, yeah. It's not public speaking, but I mean, I'm, I'm a lot more confident in it now. Not because I was born with the gift or anything like that, I was far from it. It was um, because I got a job that required me to be pretty social. And then What as a result- it? What was the job? It was a, such a good job. It was when I was, in, when I was going through uni, I was working yeah. at the, the Australian Poker League. So what we did was we put together um, poker tournaments in pubs and clubs mm. and and a whole bunch of areas and I, and I was over uh, where I grew up around the Hills District so I was the tournament director for a whole bunch of these tournaments and um, you'd have to you'd walk around you'd be talking to people and you'd be on the microphone kind of emceeing mm. and facilitating the entire event um, so that was really good because it um, forced you to come out of your shell a little bit interact shitload with a lot of people And I was super obsessed with poker at the time. It was such a good game. Did you go for that job because you wanted to get better in public speaking or was that, was that a like a byproduct? It. it was a part of it. So I yeah. could see that there were skill gaps I was missing, right? So I was reading books, um, like just the classic books, like um, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, just um, all these personal development and um, business books mm. combined, Richard Branson's books and stuff like that. So from that, I started to realize like there were some common elements that drive success in my mind. And all of the people that I look up to also have all of these common elements. Okay, so, what are the common elements? I want well, to know. I think being good with people is yeah. really, really important. Yeah. And I wasn't necessarily good with people at the very beginning. So um, like I learned how to. And then there's another one, which is learning. So, and it's and still now, right now, I'm actually focused on learning how to learn more, most effectively. So Tim Ferriss, love that dude. So he's, hmm. he really knows how to, how to break down the learning process. And I'm also like starting to really dig dude named Josh Waitskin, who's also on Tim Ferriss' podcast, who's an amazing learner. He's written a book called The Art of Learning, which I'm really excited oh, about. I have to. not heard of it So, yet. so and if you think about like, a folk like Warren Buffett, hmm. like these, this, this dude, spends so many hours of the day just reading, you know, and look how wise that guy is. Um, so, and every other, every other entrepreneur that I look up to um, has an avid amount, spends an avid amount of time learning, whether it's through audio books or reading, whatever that might be. And if you think about the journey as an entrepreneur, um, there is no real path. You're, you're, you're creating one. And when you're creating one, It's no textbook that you can just open up and be like, oh yeah, this is what you need to do, A, B, and C, and then I'm going to make it. You kind of have to figure out what A, B, C, or D, or E, or F, or G, or whatever it is um, that's needed to get done in order for you to move the business forward or move to that next milestone. And so you've got to learn a shitload real quick. Yeah. So I think that, you know, some common elements is being able to learn really quickly. Do you think, like, with learning, like, do you think it's more about reading or is it about actually doing? It depends on the person. Yeah. So, well, I think learning through actions and making mistakes is like inevitably one of the strongest ways that you learn. When you yeah. make a massive mistake, you feel that. And because it um, hurts. It hurts. It's visceral, in man. The, like here and in the pocket. Like <laughs> yeah. Money gone. Bye-bye, money. Yeah, but yeah, so the lesson <laughs> slaps you across the face when you make a mistake, which yeah. sometimes you need. Um, but, you know, some people are very good when it comes to audio. Some people are really great when it comes to reading. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it depends. Some people are really good at through conversations and learning through other people or whatever that might be. So it's important to understand what you're most receptive to in terms of processing info, um, but then also you know how you can fit stuff into your lifestyle. Yes. Yeah. So I guess yeah. you gotta naturally already have this drive wanting to learn stuff because 
that's pretty much what startups are about. Like you said, it's about yeah. learning. You learn you know, something every single day. Yeah, right? I mean, I think oh. the combination that drives success in a startup is uh, resilience first and foremost. Like you got to got to have some drive so that you can go through the ups and downs that are inevitable in, in the journey, both you know, from business point of view, but also like emotional ups and downs. Like it's fucking hectic sometimes. Yeah. Um, so there's that resilience. Um, problem solving. Mm -hmm. So um, being able to enjoy the journey of problem solving and overcoming things and then attracting the right people that are able to help problem solve with you together, I think is extremely important. Um, and then I think kind of what feeds a lot of that is, yeah, like your why, you know, you got to be passionate about it. You got to care about the problem. That's you're the, and that's, that's the really thing, right? Too. I mean, you kind of had it a little bit easy, if I may say. Like, you know you were passionate about music. Yeah. So you knew yourself well, but there are also a lot of founders that... Got... Okay, here's, here's a good question. Um, well, I think it's good. Um, <laughs> so there are so there are different... So I noticed there are different type of founders. So there are yeah. founders that are passionate. Yeah. Um, and they're going in because they are passionate. They mm -hmm. have a problem. They want to solve it. And they're super passionate about the industry. And then you have founders that are more about the end the end goal, which is, you know, having an exit and they just basically maybe come from a business perspective of mm. seeing oh there's a market for this and they go in with that idea. Yeah. So it's completely different founders. What mm -hmm. make I mean, I don't I can't ask like what's the better founder, but um do you think that the ultimate the ultimate success would be if it comes from passion? Or I think both is important. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can have, um, like I've met some founders that are really passionate about the problem that they're solving. Um, and they definitely have the drive, you know, to do that. And that's actually the most, the rarest thing. There are a lot of really smart people out there that have all the ability in order to build a successful company. But the drive is the thing that's really rare. Um, so I've had, I've met people that have the drive, but then they don't have the, the willingness or openness to learn. So mm -hmm. then they're quite stuck in their ways and then they'll bang it against the wall. It's not working. They'll just try harder and harder and harder. It's, it's, um, it can be quite sad to see someone just keep doing that and not adapting and learning. And it's just because, because it wears, wears someone down. Um, but then the other side of it, um, you've got founders that are very calculated and like, well, I want to build this so I can flip it in two years. Um, very much about the end result, it's a cash grab type of mentality. Um, so they're quite tactical and intelligent, but you know when shit gets rough, or when you really have to navigate um, and build a product that people are going to love, you might not be as close to the customer. For example, this is one example of of, mm. of many other things that can go wrong if you're just purely tactical or don't have a really strong why or drive as to why you have to do it. I think it's really important to have both because. Yeah. Um, you need to have the drive and the passion that'll get you through it all and, and it'll allow you to really want to have a positive impact in the world um, and build a product with love that other people will be able to love. And then second to that, you do have to take an evidence-based business approach to building a successful company. That's what investors look for. Um, it's what you need to do in order to be to manage resources effectively. Mm. You need to have the right budgeting in place. You need to be able to build the right teams. Um, you need to have some really strong science and rigor behind your marketing and to make that the most efficient as possibly can. And that stuff is just like hardcore business type stuff. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the numbers are going to be important and you've got to be able to generate what, what's revenue. What's your background, by the way? <clears throat> so what's I did, your background? <laughs> I, did a, I did an accounting and finance double degree at uni. You did? Yeah. Oh, yeah. that comes in handy now, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm still not convinced I really learned that much at oh, uni because yeah. I fell asleep a lot in my lectures <laughs> and lost, oh. lost my soul in the process of that degree. But, but I got through it. Um, but then I realized that I actually like, really liked marketing. So then I worked in digital media and oh. advertising for a couple of years and managed multi-million dollar budgets on behalf of big brands. Really enjoyed that, um, and then I founded this company, and we started we started closing deals with brands. We actually kicked off a campaign at the beginning of this year, where a brand and, and a media partner bought a number of memberships from us in bulk, mm -hmm. and um, they bolted it on as part of their loyalty rewards program. And it's yeah, it's been it's been an amazing deal, and we've actually got a lot of interest in that area. And 
my experience being able to speak the language of brands and understand how their budgets work has actually played a big part in being able to, to allow us to, to start doing this. And also when we were shopping out to market with the, with the cultures or thing as well, it was quite useful. Now the but puzzle comes together. I see now yeah. it all like fell into place really. But the thing is, yeah. I didn't go into media thinking, oh, my next business is going to work with brands. No, right? but yeah. It's, but you just, it's all about skill acquisition. You just yeah. always constantly learning. <clears throat> and then, yeah, it's always going to come in handy in one way or another. I think it's um, success is um, part, it's very much correlated to how much value you can add to the world. So yeah. just, yeah, invest in yourself and become super valuable. You'll also do sports then, I guess. Is it just learning? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, like, think about the car analogy, right? Um, you, if, if you don't have good health, you don't have a well-oiled engine, you're not going to have the energy in order to do what you need to do. You're not going to have the energy to read, you're not going to have the energy to build your startup, you're not going to have energy so, to keep going so for So what years. do you do, sport-wise? Um, I play basketball. Ah, oh, I like basketball. I, That's cool. I try to go to the gym, but I just find it really boring. But yeah, it's just boring. It's a yeah. bit depressing. Like in like I don't know. I do yoga every day, thirty minutes. Oh, that's, that's really good. good. Yoga's good. It's really good for the. Actually, like, yoga's really good. I started to do a bit of yoga as well. Oh, there you because, go. Because um, what I really found that what what I found at the beginning of this year um was Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Oh my god, love it. It's like human chess, but it pushes you physically in a way that yeah you've just what, never what thought do you possible do? like i don't understand human chess do you know you know you have to watch ufc no sorry mixed martial yeah, arts UFC. okay yeah, yeah, yeah it's like it's mixed martial arts ufc so it's like punching kicking wrestling all together in one but whenever you're on the ground um whenever they they wrestle on the ground and grapple um they're typically practicing brazilian jiu-jitsu which is one of the most effective forms of martial arts where you can do mm. arm locks and chokes and all sorts of other oh, things love, and there's nothing like a good choke <laughs> <laughs> God. Uh, uh, i'm i could go down so many different paths with that no no let's But just let's just uh, this, what's the startup podcast was it no i don't know what it is anymore Kat, it's Kat's gonna it's gonna change start to project a lot of <laughs> no, a lot of I'm projecting. personality oh and preferences in, in the podcast anyway. right now We got I'm gonna, I, yeah. could have, I could have pushed the button on that, but <laughs> you know what? Don't push any like, <laughs> I don't like buttons to be pushed. Um, I think we're at the end of this podcast. And um, no, yeah, no, it's been good. It's been good and pleasant until the end. For everyone who's interested to get their bums off their couch, um, I'll put the link into the description box so you can check out Gigden and subscribe. And uh, are there any discounts or something? <laughs> we can go a discount for you. Maybe we can do something. But well, what can we do? What can we do? You can check the link. Check the link. And we will. There will be have some the surprise. All right, this is it for today, guys. If you enjoyed this uh, podcast, give us a thumbs up and make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel to get more startup insights and lots of random things. If you haven't heard of Kicked In, that's gonna give you a quick. Nah, this is shit. <laughs> I'm gonna do it again. So I'll just stop talking until you ask me a question. <laughs> no, you can do whatever you want. I thought we were filming. We 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 I thought we were gonna have a conversation. It was <laughs> like, no, that was just the intro. It's just me talking. Oh, okay. And you Sorry. sit with me and just give me some props and credibility. <laughs> that was alright. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Intro, outro, right? Yeah. Uh, gotta do it again. I have to tell everyone to subscribe to the YouTube channel. It's important. <laughs> you, got a, you got a meeting? Okay. <laughs> This is good.